So um, here we are. We made it. It's uh, Q&A. And um, the format is that uh, it's first in best dressed with the questions. And I will do my best to answer anything. And if I don't know the answer, the answer will be, I don't know. Um, so, uh, and maybe if I don't know, or even if I do know, someone else on the call will know, so we can, we can crowdsource it. Uh, so it's first in best dressed with the questions. And so type them into the chat and it just, uh, like a one hand typing with terrible grammar and spelling is totally fine. Cause then, uh, when we get to that question, I can just ask you to unmute and you can you know, explain it <laughs> in a little bit more detail. Um, so just, if you just put ASDF or something in there, um, as a question, then we'll know it's who it's from and whoever types fastest gets their question answered first. Uh, and so whilst you're, uh, typing in, I'm just going to start off with, uh, something that came in over the, over the interwebs during the week. Um, Lee, you've, bam, you're quick off the off the trigger there. So I'm impressed by that. It actually reminds me, maybe some of you are too young to remember this, but back in my youth, they used to have this thing called radio and you would, they had these sort of competitions where they would, you know, you had to wait to hear some kind of secret song or something. And when they played that song, like if you were the first caller, you know, when they played this song, then you get some kind of prize, like it was like an LP record or something you would get. Anyone remember those kind of situation and so do you remember did you ever like sit by the phone every time a song was coming towards the end you're like okay dial all of the numbers except one number on your push button phone or your rotary dial phone and you're sitting there going okay is, and then i'm going to dial almost pull the rotary dial but not actually let it go until the song ends and it, is it is it the secret song yeah actually one time i run a paul mccartney album true story all right anyway so lee I don't know whether you had previously typed out that question and just copied and pasted it into the chat, but either way, yeah, I'm yeah. impressed. I checked. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's impressive. That's awesome. <laughs> um, and, I, and I want to fully acknowledge, fully acknowledge your, um, your efforts there. Um, so, uh, and also there's a great question from Penny, from Fanny. So I'm going to answer a question that came over the internet first, um, uh, which I think is a really interesting one. And then we'll get, uh, to Lee's question and Fanny's question and anyone anyone else's question that comes in. All right, so the first question I want to talk through is one from Cole Devine. And Cole says, I've been following your emails for a year and find them very informative. I'm hoping you may be able to add, to help my 27-year-old daughter that has chronic back pain. She has had an x-ray and her lower disc is desiccated. If you could advise us on any way you may be able to help, that would be great. Great question. And there are a number of questions in there. So um, chronic back pain is just defined as back pain that they've had for three months or more. Um, and so let's talk about a desiccated disc. So um, in uh, in, betw in between each pair of your vertebral bones, you have a an intervertebral disc, and that just means it's a disc in between two vertebral bones. Um, and the disc is uh, the discs are a basically they're a coiled ligament. Right, so let, let me show you a disc. So that is a vertebral bone and that is a vertebral bone and that kind of clear plasticky thing in between them is meant to represent a disc. It's not actually what a disc looks like, but it's, you know, close enough. And so in between each pair of vertebrae, there is a disc. And so if we looked at the discs from the top, if we looked at a vertebra from the top view, uh, the top of a vertebra, let me just pin that. Oh, thanks for spotlighting me there, Renee. If we looked at the vertebra from a top view, it looks somewhat like that. They're kind of kidney shaped. Okay. And if that's the front. And then there are kind of these 
pokey outy bits on the back of them, kind of like that. And there's this hole in here, and that's the spinal canal, and that's where your spinal cord goes from your brain down to your the rest of your body. And so this is this bit here is called the vertebral body. And I don't know how, how detailed I want to get in naming all of these parts, but let's just leave it at that and say that this part here, that's the vertebral body. So if we now just get rid of all those other bits and just think about the vertebral body, it's kind of this kidney-shaped thing from the top view. Well, that's bone, and then above that is a disc. And a disc is basically a coiled ligament which just wraps around and around and around just like that. Okay, So it's just like a strap like a, a yoga strap or a belt or something, a seat belt that is just coiled around and, you know, a ligament. That's what ligaments are. Um, and uh, it's coiled around and around and around. And as I've drawn it here, well, kind of sort of as I've drawn it here, there's this uh, a space in the middle. And that space in the middle is full of uh, fluid. And that, you know, fluid is anywhere that there's a fluid in your body, it's basically just water right, with some bits floating in it and different parts of your body fluid have different combinations of bits floating in them, you know, so if we have fluid with certain bits in it, we call that blood, if we've got a fluid with certain different bits, we call it cerebrospinal fluid, different bits, we call it uh, uh, joint fluid, you know, like, we, but it's, it's all basically just water with a few bits floating in it. And so this uh, is called the, the, the fluid in the middle is called the Nucleus pulposus, which just means the pulpy bit in the middle, you know, the soft bit in the middle, and then the bit around the 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 the, the, the concentric circles of ligament that are wound around there is called the annulus fibrosus, and annulus, if you think about you know, annual, right? It's it's a year. And and the thing about years is they come around again and again, right? So annulus just means something that, that goes around and around. Um, and fibrosis just means what it sounds like, like it's fibrous, right? So that's just the windy round and round thing that's really kind of fibrous and tough, right? And then we've got the squishy middle bit. That's literally the Latin translation of that. And... Sometimes, uh, and so as you, um, and so that, that fluid, you know, which we said is basically just water with some bits floating in it. Well, it's, it's, you know, it's got some proteins and it's got some salts and things like that floating in it. Um, and, and as you, as you go through the day, um, th uh, you have different amounts of water basically in that disc throughout the day. So I've, I'm sure you've noticed that in the very, very first thing in the morning, your back is more stiff than it is in later in the day. Um, and uh, one of the reasons for that, or possibly the main reason for that is when you lay down at night, there is no compression on the disc, like the discs aren't being squished, right? And so they, there's less pressure on them. And so water seeps in right? And then when you stand up during the day, there's more pressure on them. And so water is kind of squeezed out of them, but it's squeezed out very, very slowly because, you know, they're not very, water doesn't pass through the annulus fibrosis very easily. So it leaches out very slowly. But, uh, you know, over the course of the day, water leaves the disc, right? And so the disc gets shorter because there's less water in it. And so by the end of the day, you're a little bit shorter than you were at the start of the day. Is this kind of making sense? Thumbs up if, if you can picture this, right? And so here's the thing. On the front of your spine, this is not what your spine looks like in, in IRL. You've actually got a ligament that goes all the way down the front of your spine, just like that, right? And it's called the 
anterior longitudinal ligament, just which means the long ligament in the front, right? And it goes all the way down the front of your spine. And when you bend backwards, that ligament goes taut. It gets tight, right? And then you've got an Another ligament at the back, which is not actually right at the back here, it's inside the spinal canal on the back of the vertebral bodies. So if we looked from the top view, okay, there'd be a, there'd be the anterior longitudinal ligament here, okay, okay, and then there'd be the posterior longitudinal ligament there, okay, and that goes the whole length of this of the spine, but inside the spinal canal. Right, and the posterior longitudinal ligament, if you imagine it, when you bend forward, it goes tight. Right, it gets pulled tight. Okay, can you picture all this inside your mind's eye? Right, so you've got this anterior longitudinal ligament, posterior longitudinal ligament. Okay, and ligaments are not very stretchable. They're kind of like a seatbelt in a car. Right, like they're they're bendable. Right, but you can't stretch them. Right, if you if you get to two ends of a seatbelt and pull on it, it's going to snap and like snap taut and then it's going to not you know stretch right not like a flex band where if you pull a flex band it's going to go taut and then it's going to keep stretching so ligaments are not very stretchable uh and so when in the morning when you wake up you've got more fluid inside your disc the disc is taller and you've got like 22 discs inside your spine right so all of those discs are a bit smaller so you might be like two centimeters taller in the morning than you are in the evening Right. So measure yourself in the morning and that way you maximize your can truth the height that you can truthfully claim to be. Um so in the morning your discs are all taller, okay, which means that your long anterior anterior and posterior longitudinal ligaments are stretched tighter. Can you picture it? So if those ligaments are stretched tighter because the discs are taller and then you try and bend forwards or backwards, well the ligaments are going to go tight sooner right? So you're more stiff. And then as you go through the day and you walk around and squish your back and a bit of the fluid squeezes out over the, you know, you, those ligaments have more play in them because the discs are shorter and the vertebrae are closer together. And at the end of the day, your discs are more dehydrated. You know, the D means not and hydrated means got water in it, right? So dehydrated has got less water in it. So they're more dehydrated or they've got less water in them, which means the same thing at the end of the day, which is why they're shorter. All right. Another name for dehydrated is desiccated. It sounds like it doesn't sound like a thing you want to have your discs be, right? Desiccated. You know desiccated coconut that you get in the in the store, right? <laughs> you think of that, you're like, oh, I don't want my disc. That's not something I want my disc to be like. <laughs> Shaved bits of coconut dried off in a in a bag, you know, sealed, that can live in the cupboard for 12 months. But it just basically means dried, right? To desiccate something means to dry it, okay? Which, in other words, you remove water from it, which is the normal thing that happens in your disc over the course of the day anyway, okay? But some, you know, over the course of your life, sometimes, you know, discs, you know, the discs of 80-year-olds first thing in the morning tend to have less water in them than the discs of 20-year-olds first thing in the morning, you know? Just like the skin of 80-year-olds <laughs> has less water in it than the skin of 20-year-olds first thing in the morning, you know? Our bodies change over time. Um, so, uh, all right. So the so that kind of that sets the the, the sort of anatomy of and biomechanics a little bit of biomechanics of of what disc, what the discs are and desiccation and all of that. And so Cole says um, his twenty seven year old daughter has low back chronic low back pain and has an X ray that showed a desiccated disc. Okay. Well. Uh, we know from this particular study, Fernandez, Brinjicci, I think this is the one I want to see. No, that wasn't the one. We know, yeah, we know from, actually, no, this isn't the one. There are two there that I want to show you, but that's not that. All right, this is the one. 
So this was a systematic review from 2015 of MRI findings in people with uh, no low back pain. And they found lots of interesting things, but uh, the one that's of relevance to us here, right, this is the age-specific prevalence estimates of degenerative spine imaging findings in asymptomatic patients. So disc des- desiccation, you know, drying out of the disc, is really just, you know, another word for or is one of the main forms of disc degeneration. So when they say disc degeneration, you know, disc desiccation is one of the subtypes of that. Um, and what we what you see here is 37%, you know, more than one third of pain-free 20-year-olds have disc degeneration on MRI. By the time you're 30 years old, that's 52%. At 40 years old, it's 68%. So more than two thirds of pain-free 40-year-olds have disc desiccation or disc degeneration. And by the time you're at you know 70-year-old, it's 93% of pain-free people. So this is something that's, you know, like if, if we talked about this in terms of skin, right, and said like, you know, 50% of pain-free 40-year-olds have desiccation to their skin around their eyes. You know, you'd think like, yeah, that's called wrinkles, hello. And people, that doesn't necessarily mean that people have eye pain, you know. So it, it's just probably one of these normal age-related findings, okay, that is, you know, something that happens as we get older, but sometimes happens to young people as well. And it's not necessarily related to pain. Um, so uh, what can we do? F- uh, and finally, just as a sub note, um, x-rays don't really show discs very well. Um, x-rays show bones. They kind of cut through most of the other soft tissues. Uh, and so um, an x-ray would show that the two vertebral bones might be closer together, right, or further apart. And so if the x-ray showed the vertebral bones were closer together, then the radio, the radiologist um, might, you know, read that x-ray and go, oh, you know, the, the, the bones are closer together, therefore that disc probably has less height, therefore there's probably less water in the disc, therefore it's desiccated, right? But you can't actually see the disc on x-ray. And sometimes people just have shorter discs, right? Maybe that's... So that's not a definitive way to diagnose it. So what can you do for that person? I would say uh, the disc desiccation finding is probably just coincidental and isn't related to her back pain, most likely. And if it is, um, the best thing for it is just uh, get moving and strengthen up her back and legs and arms and all the other parts of her and um, try and just enjoy life. So, yeah, hope that all makes sense. Um, is there any part of that that we need to? You guys want to sort of chat about before we move on? Because there are a bunch of heaps, bunch of questions in here. All right. So Lee's question. All right. Sorry, Russ. Oh, yeah, um, funny. Sorry. So where does the pain come? I mean, I know pain is very complex, and it's hard to tell where the pain. But if she always have pain there. Uh, for months and months, where does it come from? What can it be like? Has someone, you know, it has to be something. <laughs> and um, then that's the that's a, I always find. Like, yeah, pain is oh, it's just something. And then probably if you have a better sleep or if you feel better, you have less pain. But if it keeps coming back, what can you do about it? Yeah, well, that's the if, sixty-four thousand dollar question. Love, I do have a clients that, oh, yeah, I've been be doing Pilates for three months and I still have a lower back pain. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, what do you tell them? Um, well, we have researched the, a lot on pain. Um, if you go to Google Scholar or um, EBSCO database or some other kind of online research portal and type in low back pain, you'll get more than 2 million results, right? There, there are... Uh, just unbelievably large numbers of research papers dealing with this topic. Um, And sadly, of all of those 2 million research papers, the best treatment we've got only works a little bit. You know, like we're about as good at fixing low back pain now as we were at fixing, I don't know, cancer in the 1850s, Mm. you know, which is to say pretty poor right? We're not very good at it. 
Um, and, and most treatments for low back pain, you know, whether it's surgery or whether it's exercise or whether it's psychotherapy or whether it's, you know, intensive pain clinic management or whatever, they only reduce the pain a bit, right? Mm. So, so if, if you came to, to, to me and said, I've got a six out of 10 low back pain, right? And, and we did the best evidence-based treatments that there are available, you know, so you've got all of the most intensive up-to-date evidence-based treatments. We could expect that you're statistically, you know, that your pain would go from a six out of 10 to about a four out of 10. Okay. Right? And that's just because we kind of suck at treating low back pain, right? We just really don't know what causes it. With all of those, you know, 2 million studies though, we have found out some things, right? And, and what the things that we found out are that it's very, very, very overwhelmingly probable that low back pain is just not caused by a single thing, right? There is no smoking gun there is no silver bullet there is no like single root cause of of anyone's low back pain not to not not that there's not one universal cause even for every person there's not one cause for that person right? so pain seems to be a complex uh, or a result of complex interactions between multiple factors right sort of like an economy right <laughs> or or you know relationship well, you know, it's it's just it's really freaking complicated, mm. uh, and and you know, like if 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 you know, I'm not qualified to give relationship advice, right? But I've taken some relationship advice in my day, and when people say, "Oh, the one secret to a happy marriage is blah blah blah," I'm like, "Yeah, that doesn't you know, that's not true, right? There's no one secret, <laughs> right? It's a whole bunch of stuff, and it probably changes over time and depends who your partner is and what your life priorities are and how many kids you've got and all of that stuff." You know, so there there is no one secret to a to a happy marriage. I'm pretty sure of it. And that likewise, there's no one secret. You know, there's no one weird trick that you can do to lose belly fat. And there's no one, you know, cause of anyone's low back pain. So it's going to be some combination of what's going on in the tissues, what's going on uh, systemically in terms of inflammation and and other things. You know, immune response that are happening. Um, the upper or down regulation of the central nervous system based on sleep, stress, anxiety, mental health. Um, you know, we know that people who have depression have more pro-inflammatory chemicals floating around in their bloodstream than people who don't have depression, right? So there are so, you know, and that can exacerbate pain. So there are so many, you know, complex factors that go to contribute to this that the the plain honest answer is we just don't know. Okay. <laughs> um, but we do know, you know, things that help a bit, right? And we don't really know why they help, right? And we know that exercise helps a bit and we know that, you know, getting good sleep helps a bit and we know that having improved mental health helps a bit, right? Um, and we know that these things are somewhat additive, you know, so if you do all of the above, it might help a little bit more than doing any one of those things. But we don't really know why exercise works because it seems like, any form of exercise works equally well, right? If we try walking, we're like, oh, walking helps low back pain. But then we try deadlifting, we're like, oh, deadlifting helps the same amount. And then we try like retraining your core, and we're like, oh, that helps the same amount too. And then we try going for psychotherapy, and we're like, oh, that helps the same amount as well. So it's like, and then we're scratching our heads going like, yeah, what causes it? Don't know. So the best advice is uh, get moving, doing some form of movement that you enjoy, and uh, do things to improve your mental health, whether that's go for a walk in nature, spend more time with your loved ones, or go and get some professional help. And uh, try not to worry, because we know that worry makes things worse. Yeah. Thanks. So it's a really long answer to a short question, and um, probably a really unsatisfactory answer, but I'm sorry, that's the best we got. No, but at least on a, we're on the same page. So that's <laughs> um, All right, so least question. Hi, Raf. I'm a Set4 student and have a friend who's a candidate for me to use for some practice teaching. Awesome. He's in his late 60s, slim and active, walking around 10 kilometers every day. <sighs> he is awesome. After experiencing back pain accompanied by shooting pain down one leg, he's been diagnosed with facet joint disease and stenosis, ranging from mild to severe. He has been offered surgery, but he's apprehensive about this and would prefer not to go down that road. I've suggested that the right kind of movement and progressive loading may help. Before I proceed, though, I want to make sure that I know my stuff. Uh, what would you recommend? I have a few other questions around this, so hopefully we'll get 
to chat. Okay. So, um, sounds like your friend's already doing a lot of good, healthy lifestyle behaviors. Um, and so there's probably not a lot that we can do in terms of like, you know, tuning up his, his lifestyle. Um, he's exercising, he's, you know, doing all those things. Um, so basically he's got pain in his back and it's going down one leg. Uh, and the, the, the lay person's term for that is, do you guys know what the lay person's term for that is? Pain going down a leg? Type it into the chat. Take a guess when you've got pain down your leg. All right. What the lay person's term is and anyone want to take a crack at what the scientific term for it is? When you got pain down your leg, due to sciatica. Sciatica is the layperson's term. Okay. Yes. <laughs> that was correct. Anyone want to take a crack at the the scientific term? Someone said. Uh, <laughs> someone's got it close. Piriformis. <laughs> uh, no, that's I all. That that's 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 a kind of one of the diagnoses that can contribute to, you know, to explaining this. Mm-hmm. It's called radiculopathy. Or radicular pain, not ridiculous, but radicular, like radiating, you know. Um, uh, and so, um, radiculopathy just means something wrong. Opathy just means something wrong, right? So, um, radicular pain basically is the the, the technical term. Um, but people call it sciatica because the sciatic nerve goes down from your lower back through your butt, basically, and down the back of your leg to your toes. And so, um, if you pinch on or cause a bit of irritation to the sciatic nerve um, somewhere in the, like the low back or the butt, um, you can get spurious, you know, like not real um, information coming up to your brain going, hey, someone's stabbing you in the back of the calf with a knife or someone's putting a red hot poker on the back of your thigh and no one's really doing those things, but you have the, the body sensation that someone is doing that because you've got a spurious, you know, false signal being generated through that nerve because it's being pinched or irritated or inflamed or something at some point, you know, upstream. So sort of like if someone was crimping the telephone wires, back when we used to have wires in telephones, that you would get, you know, it would sound like the call was coming from Texas, but really it's coming from somewhere else because someone's just hack, you know, on the cowboy movies where they hack into the telegraph telegraph wire near the train. Right, so so uh, that is you know a basic description of uh, radicular pain, radiculopathy slash uh, sciatica, and uh, so that's you know sounds like the symptoms that you and that's just a, that's a description of symptoms, right? Sciatica, radiculopathy. That's a description of symptoms. It's not a it's not an explanation of the cause of those symptoms. Um, and so your friend's been diagnosed with uh, facet joint uh, something, facet joint. Arthritis, did you say? Uh, no, fast joint disease and stenosis. All right. So, um, I'm not sure if that's going to be clear enough. I think think it is. Actually, maybe it's not. I'm going to draw you a picture. So, the facet joints are, if we look from the side view of the spine, there's a vertebra. There's a disc. And there's the next vertebra. I'm drawing them a bit of out of scale, but you get the gist. All right, so this is the front. This is the back. Probably choose a better color. Which gives me the opportunity to slightly improve. There, bam, now they touch. All right. So this here is a facet joint. And you have an upper and a lower. So there's an upper and lower facet joint there. And then this here, what other color can I use? This one here. 
this gap here behind the back of the disc and in front of the facet joint, that is where your nerve root, you know, the, 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 basically the nerve exits the spine. So you've got this, this nerve going up and down your, your spinal cord is, is a nerve or is a bunch of nerves going up and down inside the spinal canal and bits of that come out in that gap there behind the disc and in front of the facet joint. And you can see here on this plastic model that here are the, the nerves coming out, okay? And the facet joint is there, okay? And you'll see as I bend the spine, actually the facet joint opens up and closes. And that's the facet joint... Oh, it's hard for me to put my finger there. That's it. That's my, the facet joint there. And you see that it opens and closes. Now, that facet joint is actually nowhere near the nerve, right? So the facet joint uh, issue, you know, uh, disease, which typically refers to arthritis or degeneration, okay, might be expected to be related to pain at the facet joint, right? But I can't really think of a way that that would influence the nerve going down the leg because it's just they're not they're not touching, right? They're anatomically they're separate structures. So, uh, so I think that's kind of a side issue. That's that's not relevant. Um, typically, by the way, facet joints, as you bend forward, right? If you look at the facet joint here, okay, that separates, okay. And as you bend backward, again, here's the facet joint, the facet joints close, they compress. Can you see that? They open and then they compress, right? Can you see that that that, that happens? Right. So as you bend backwards, okay, the facet joints are compressed. So if the facet joint was a little bit irritated, inflamed or whatever, okay, we, when would you expect it to hurt more, in backward bending or forward bending? Unmute and, and say it or... This is not just for Lee, this is for everyone. Or type yeah, backward bending. Backward bending, right? Because you're compressing it, right? So any pain that is related to the facet joint, you would expect to be aggravated by backward bending. And consequently, it would probably be alleviated by forward bending, right? Because you take the pressure off it. Does that make sense? So if he's got pain that's aggravated by backward bending and alleviated by forward bending, well, that might be related to a facet joint. And so stenosis just refers to narrowing of the spinal canal. It, it's just a generic term. It doesn't say why it's narrowed. It just says that it's narrowed, right? And that can be for a number of reasons, you know, bony growth. It can be inflammation. It can be the disc changing shape. Lots of different things can cause stenosis, right? But we don't know why. From your friend's diagnosis, it just says that it is narrowed, okay? And so the problem with that is as you move, right, your 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 these little gaps here where the where the nerves come out, they're called the neural foramen. Foramen just means hole, you know, gap, okay? And neural just means to do with the nerve. Okay. So as you as you bend and, and whatever, those open up and close down. And there's plenty of space in there, but if they narrow beyond a certain degree, well when they're closed and then maybe you twist around or move your arm or leg and that nerve gets pulled on, well it can rub. You know, it can rub on the bones there and you know, get irritated, you know, inflamed. Itis means inflamed. So, and then if that nerve becomes irritated, well, it can send a signal to your brain saying, oh, there's someone sticking a hot poker into the back of your knee. But in reality, it's not. It's being irritated up here, you know, in this hypothesis. Now, again, if we look at the the foramen there, the hole, the gap, okay, in between those two vertebrae where the, where the nerve exits, okay, look as we bend forwards, and as we bend backwards, can you see that that foramen changes size as we bend forwards and backwards? Thumbs up if you can see it changing size. All right, so it plainly gets smaller as you bend backwards, right? So if you had a narrowing of the neural foramen, okay, aka stenosis, right, and it was narrowed enough that it was kind of causing a bit of constriction for that nerve, okay, 
when would you expect it to be more aggravated and when would you expect it to be less aggravated? Would it make a difference if you moved your back in a different position or would it all just be always the same? Type it in or unmute. Not a rhetorical it's question. Aggravated when you do extension. Correct. Right? Because the foramen is narrower when you're in extension. So the nerve would have less space, right? And if there's already less space and then you go into extension, then there's, that's when there's the least space, right? So again, you would expect sciatic pain due to stenosis to probably be aggravated by extension, right? And what would you expect to happen during flexion in regard to symptoms? Release? Probably offload, right? Because it, it opens up the foramen as you flex, Right, so you if you have him backbend, you know maybe do like lie on the floor and do ten cobra push-ups, you know like backbend push-ups, right? Or just stand in, go into a backbend, hold it for thirty seconds, right? Then ask him, how's your leg pain now? Better, worse, or same? Right? If he says like, no, it's killing me like a line of fire down the back of my leg, right? Huh? Well, it seems like it was aggravated by backbending, right? Then have him stand up and do some forward bends. Do 10 forward bends, toe touches. How's your back now? Oh, my leg's feeling fantastic. Huh. It's relieved by forward bending. Well, that would suggest that hmm, it possibly is related to, you know, some kind of irritation of the nerve root where it exits the foramen there. And now you know what you get out of jail free card is, is like, well, limit the extension, right? Don't avoid it altogether, but just, you know, don't go crazy on it and do more flexion. Right? And flexion is not going to fix it. Right, You could do 10,000 million toe touches. It's, you're still going to have stenosis. So it's, it's not going to fix the stenosis, but if it's going to pro- possibly you know, alleviate the symptoms. Um, and so I would say if, he, if that's enough for him, great, there's your formula. Right? Um, and if that doesn't work or if it doesn't work enough you know, for him, um, then... Uh, Surgery for stenosis actually does have reasonably good outcomes, um, like as in better than just exercise therapy, but it's not very significant. It's like, you know, again, it's sort of like from, from that six out of 10 to four out of 10 for exercise, and surgery might take it to three out of 10. You know, so surgery is not necessarily the nuclear bomb that's going to, you know, <laughs> kill it, but it, it, for some people it is, but it's, it's, it's overall, it's, shown to be better than exercise alone but for some people exercise is enough so i would definitely start with the backward bending forward bending test okay and do repeated back bending repeated forward bending see if that alleviates see if it aggravates and whatever alleviates or aggravates we'll just do more of what alleviates and do less of what aggravates right there's your basic formula and then see how he goes with that and if after a couple of months he's like yeah i'm fine this is good i can live with this great and if he's like no this kind of still sucks that's when you should go talk to someone about surgery Right. From, yeah. a practical, from a practical point of view, from aiding him beyond that past the diagnosis, it's worth then exactly following on from what you said, then looking at his, um, if that forward bending does help that bit, to turn it into what he does when he's walking with that lifestyle, is to just have him walk around, check that anterior tilt of his pelvis. If that's then creating that overextension in the lumbar spine, getting traduced by connecting into those lower abdominals, making that practicality he could be walking with effectively a duck walk putting that pressure onto there so that slight posterior tilt like you would with a post a prenatal woman trying to get that sense of reducing that angle in the lumbar spine especially with the amount of his walking that could be sort of that next step in practically engaging that from diagnosis into what will help him with his walking which is not going to stop mm. And he should Just absolutely thought. continue his walking. Yeah, and I, I, you yeah, know, yeah, so yeah. absolutely. And if if so, you know, to even broaden that out further, if if you find that flexion helps, you have to test it, right? Because it's not guaranteed that it is going to help him, right? But if you find that it does help, well, just figure out how can he do more of that in his everyday activities. You know, in the way that he's sitting, in the way that he's walking, in the you know, etc. Um, to alleviate those symptoms. And again, just to, I want to emphasize, it's not going to fix anything. It's just going to reduce the discomfort, basically. Anyone else got anything to add to that? 
Raf, I was just going to say thanks for that. That's really confirmed a lot of what I was thinking. Um, I don't know if we've got time to go into it, but uh, something I wanted to touch on, there's a bit of an interesting backstory with this case um, in the fact that he really doesn't get any symptoms during the day. Uh, and he tells me he can extend the back without pain. I don't think he's done an exercise routine as far as doing multiple reps, so that might be the telling factor. Um, but he gets very little discomfort during the day. Um, he It wakes him up at night, nearly every night. Does, when he, sleep he's in on his, does he sleep on his front or his back? I don't know. That would be the ask. question I'd be asking because when you're in your front, yeah. you're in extension. When you're on your yeah. back, you're more in, in a flex position or on your side. So okay. I'd ask him what position he sleeps in. And he yeah. probably already goes, oh, yeah, what, it wakes me up when I'm on my tummy and I know if I roll on my side, it feels better. You know, he's probably yeah. already figured that out, you know, if, yeah. that, if that's the case. Yeah. And, and pathology reasons aside, I was wondering when we think about the psychosocial reasons, the, the story behind this, his wife uh, has, in the last 12 months has, has developed dementia and it's coming on quite rapidly. And I know it's causing him a lot of worry. He's a really happy guy. Um, he doesn't show it. But I'm thinking, you know, when he lays down and goes to bed, I'm sure all the thoughts are going through his head. And, you know, I guess the outcome of today was, is there anything, you know, that I, I shouldn't be doing from an exercise point of view? But the other thought was, if, if there's not, then maybe just building the expectation of a favourable outcome, getting him moving might be the plan. But I just wanted to make sure there was something I shouldn't be doing, that's all. No, I mean, anything that makes his foot go numb is probably something you should avoid. But yeah. apart from that, you know, do more of what or what feels good and less of yep. what less of what aggravates. Yeah. Yep. Great. Thanks, Raf. All right. Fanny has a question which is uh, I'm interested in the exercise after hip replacement. Can you tell us what are the do's and don'ts? Well, I'm gonna defer over to Kerr here because my recollection is this was your kind of jam a couple of years ago when last we talked. Is that is that still the case? Or did I misremember that? Uh, no, I get a lot of people like that, but it's not entirely my my jam. I, I have to deal with a lot of people with hip replacement. Most of it's just about, you know, if, like you say, with a lot of things, getting that confidence, getting them to understand. Often after the hip replacement, there is a danger of dislocation, um, and so building up that that position because a, a, a hip replacement isn't as good as the real thing. Um, but then often it's that it's that getting to recognize there's no longer really an issue with the hip joint. It's now the muscularity around it that then presents the problem. So getting them to actually use the joint with confidence and then it's so um, getting them to, to find their range and build that over time. Um, but it's it, often they'll, they'll believe that they're unstable. They'll believe that they can't do things that they can't wait there. So getting them to understand that, 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 that now you know, they've got a new joint. Yay. You know, it's like you suddenly got a 20 year old part of your body and in a, in a, in the rest of you 50, you almost want to replace the rest of it. But that confidence with getting someone moving again and building that strength around it, getting them to not be, to understand that difference between joint pain and muscular work. Um, and then being able to build their range of motion over time, you need to, you know, it's pretty easy to look up the, the limitations for range of movement, what type of um, hip joint they've had replaced. So that would then give a, a, a different point of where the mobility, because the, the hip joint on the rig, original socket, that socket really wraps around that hip joint, but we can't do that with a fake one. So it's a bit more of a cup, a bit more like a shoulder rather than that full wrap around. So there are points where dislocation is more likely, but um, as long as you're aware of that and get them moving with confidence. And it's, again, not fast, slow motion. Obviously, people can feel things coming there. And then they and then apply it, getting them used to getting up in and out of chairs, shifting weight side to side, understanding the muscularity of that. I get a lot of stuff with, with them where they're afraid to come into squats and lunges and sitting and, and actually getting to understand the biodynamics that there's no longer a real issue with the hip. It's now their mind and the and the muscles that they need to work on and getting better movement. Um, their relationship between knee and hip and, and foot, work it, work it through the rest of the body, getting them aware of that. Um, but certainly the timeline of replacement, once they're clear to exercise, a huge part of it is their mind. Um, and, and, and it's amazing how quickly you can get past that and get them actually enjoying their movement 
and getting used to strength and going, wow, my glutes work and my, and my thighs work and all this so that I can be active. You know, I find people with uh, hip replacements can be actually, you can push them really quite hard. Uh, once, they, once you build that confidence, you can keep progressing quite surprisingly rapidly um, and then they feel great. And then it's, it's, you know, I find more problems with things like ACL injuries than with hip replacements. Yeah, hip replacements, actually, it's in, it is a very major surgery. I mean, they're actually chopping off part the top part of your thigh bone <laughs> and gouging out a bit of your hip socket and replacing it with titanium and ceramic. So it's a pretty major operation. But they actually, um, these days, uh, they actually don't generally sever, you know, many of the muscles and things around there. So the recovery is very, very quick physiologically. And typically the physiotherapy involves like walking on day one of the day of the surgery, they're walking, um, weight bearing on it. So it's, you know, the recovery is generally very quick. And um, you know, typically people, by the time they have a hip replacement, it's because they've had end, end stage osteoarthritis of the hip. And so for the last 20 years, I've had like constant hip pain and they've been avoiding using it and avoiding positions that are painful and stuff. And so they've got like 20 years of learning to avoid using that hip. And all of a sudden you're asking them to do squats and, and things like that. And so there's, there's going to be a lot of fear and a lack of trust in the hip, I guess. And so just, it's more about just encouraging them to move as normally as possible and just strengthening it up. And, and this person's probably, you know, not always, but have typically, you know, got out of the habit of exercising that body part. And often they're using other parts of their body differently as a result of that pain. So then you're looking at how they, how they walk, where those retraining walking habits, which, you know, physio only lasts so long. You can see a lot of that into things like footwork on the foot bar on a reformer, things like that, where they put their weight into their foot and it'll all come back to where that pain was pre-surgery. So working with them on, on improving the biodynamics of their walking. And yeah, as I say, they literally are up within hours on their feet, making them walk straight away these days, getting them so that they don't sit there and, and, and hold back, getting them to actually use the joint now. But that retraining practical work, getting them away from that, thinking of, you know, that inherent I've compensated for pain for so long that that's now my habit. You're looking then follow on habits. And then you'll probably find that that new habits create other things that you've got to work with. So, I mean, they're great clients. They keep coming back for ages, but you keep working through until eventually you run out of problems. It's, it's, it's actually hips are a, are a fun thing to work with once you get confidence into people. So will you get them back to exercise straight after surgery then if you say they will have to walk on day one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, again, it's that thing, you shorter ranges, but definitely weight built, weight bearing. They've got to build up that musculature. There's going to be a healing time, um, but the physios do. Day one, I've, I've had, you know, most clients now, they're, they have, they're basically – they're on their feet being told to walk within something like three or four hours of the surgery. So basically once the, the anesthetic's worn off and it's no longer a balance issue, they get them walking straight away. Mm. The only thing, like I said, you just have to wear a range of motion during the tissue healing time when they've still got stitches and stuff mm. that you don't, you know, stretch them too far and tear the, the, mm. the stitches and whatnot. But, you know, these are people that will be shuffling around and stuff, so you don't need to worry about them doing the splits accidentally. Yeah, so it's it's just general, just you know, general strengthening, but it's really much mostly about the confidence and and getting. And then you'll see the guidelines for like three months, six months. By after about six months, you should they should be expected to be to be you know normal normal range of motion. Some limitations. There are things that you should avoid because that the the, the shape of the joints. Um, there are risks in certain directions of, of dislocation, but as long as they're aware of that, then. You can work with that totally and increase range of motion in other directions. All right. Got time for one, maybe two more. And uh, thanks so much for that, Kurt. Appreciate it. And good question, Fanny. Was it Fanny who asked that? Yes, it was. Yes. Um, Laura Diaz says, hey, I'd like to know how to approach a client who has had recent surgery removing the bottom section of one of her lungs. Obviously, respecting tissue healing times is important and making sure they've been cleared for stage two rehab. But is there any other pointers you might be able to give many thanks? So Laura, was this per did this person have cancer or was there some other reason? Do you know why? Um, there was a chronic infection. So she's had lung issues similar to um, sort of cystic fibrosis, but not 
the whole lungs. It's just this this portion of our lung that wasn't healing properly. So um, they decided to chop half of it off and, yeah, so that's where she's at. <laughs> okay, and was that a laparoscopic surgery? So they just did a little keyhole surgery or did was it open surgery, do you know? I actually don't know. Um, no, I think it was actually because I remember her saying she had tubes in between mm-hmm. her ribs. Mm-hmm. So um, I'd say that's laparoscopic, yeah. Great. So the laparoscopic surgery where they just put it basically a tube, you know, a couple of tubes in and one tube they put a camera down, the other one they put the surgical instruments and stuff they have much quicker recovery and much uh, less uh, complications from those surgeries because it's just a, a smaller wound. You know, there's less less surgery. Um, so, and that means they don't have to cut through any muscles in the torso or any of that kind of stuff. Um, so I would expect that, you know, kind of the obvious things are, that occur to me are, well, her, her lung capacity is reduced, but presumably her lung capacity kind of was reduced before the surgery anyway, right? So nothing new there. And, you know, when you're doing Pilates, you're probably, you know, even if you're doing like relatively strenuous stuff like lunges and things, you're probably only using 40% of your lung capacity anyway. So that shouldn't be an issue for her in Pilates unless you do like heaps of burpees and <laughs> things like that. Um, uh, it, there may be some kind of uh, challenge to, you know, some of the muscles around that area that were involved in the surgery, maybe her diaphragm, maybe her obliques, maybe her pectoralis, maybe her serratus anterior, you know, maybe none of the above, right? But she just, she, there may be some scarring or some, you know, um, changes to the, to the function of those muscles, you know, based on what they cut through or didn't cut through. Sometimes they can accidentally cut through some of the nerves that reach to, you know, they might to some of the muscles, whatever. So it's, there might be changes to the way that she moves that region of her body. And if there are, I would focus on trying to normalize those whilst not stigmatizing the way that she's moving presently, right? Because it might be the case that they, those different ways of moving are just kind of like, you know, a response to pain and, you know, um, whatever. Or it might be that they accidentally cut a nerve and that's just the way she's going to move for the rest of her life now, right? So so, so don't present it like, oh, this is a terrible way of moving. We've got to fix it for you because then what if you can't fix it? So <laughs> present it like, hey, let's see if we can get you as straight as possible on the reformer carriage today, right? Or let's see if we can, you know, make this bend as even as possible, left to right sort of thing, look in the mirror. So, But, but rather than, you know, telling her, you know, ensure that you do this or you know, that kind of thing. Um, uh, and then I, I would guess it's probably, um, you know, once she's past the initial tissue healing time, like, you know, stitches are out and, and all of that stuff, which is when you'd be working with her, um, is just, uh, you know, general exercise and building her confidence. Um, yeah. So I would, I would, and I, I would imagine that if they, if they've solved the problem with that surgery, that she'd be feeling pretty awesome <laughs> and pretty excited by her ability to move again you know, with, with less limitations. So I'll just say like, whatever, whatever, like excites her movement and she enjoys movement wise, do that, you know? Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. She's already got a lot of lung capacity back. So whereas she, her work walking up a driveway, she would have been pretty puffed out by the time she got to the top. Whereas now she can sort of, you know, she has a bit more breath about her. So, um, yeah, that's awesome. Thanks heaps for that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Tess says, I think I've got time if, if I try and squeeze it in a little bit, I've got one more. Uh, Tess says, hi Raf, you do an awesome job in your podcast in this Q and A. You're cr- truly raising the bar. Well, this isn't a question. This is a compliment. Thank you. You're truly raising the bar for Pilates teachers. Uh, I'd like to ask you about the teaching Pilates to school age kids and your advice to make it safe and fun, given their growth plates are still open, lifting really heavy things to build strength might need to be nuanced. You said nuisanced, but I think you meant nuanced. Or maybe it was maybe it was a, a play on words. Um, either way, I like it. All right. So um, uh, the actually the the ACSM, the American College of Sports Medicine guidelines on uh, strength training or resistance training for youth, is that basically if once kids are old enough to take instructions, they're old enough to do strength training. And so the actual the actual only day, that thing about the growth plates and stuff is just not a real thing. Um, I know I heard that, you know, all of you I'm imagining have heard some version of that. Um, but the danger with kids and strength training is that they'll throw things, drop things, trip over things, you know, stand underneath people holding weights and things like that. Um, so you need 
kids to be able to take instructions. You need to be able to instruct them in the safe use of the equipment, you know, springs on before you stand on the carriage and all of that kind of jazz. Um, so the safety concerns with kids are basically the same as those for adults. Um, but, uh, kids have shorter attention spans. <laughs> so, you know, you, you need to take that into consideration. And also kids are just physically smaller. So some of the things that adults sort of take for granted on a reformer, the kids just don't fit. Like try doing footwork with a seven-year-old on a reformer. It's like their feet can't reach the foot bar, <laughs> no matter how far you take the carriage stopper in and, and whatnot. But they can do things like back rowing, front rowing, um, you know, lunges and, you know, feet in straps and things like that quite happily. Um, so I think, you know, if, uh, if you if you're able to take those types of things into account, just like their physical size, um, and also their ability to to follow instructions vis a vis, you know, not running and screaming and jumping on reformers with only half a spring on them and stuff like that, um, those are the main safety considerations. So in terms of loading them, go for gold. Um, make it as fun as possible. So I'm sorry, I, I'm I'm not sure if that's a awesome answer or a semi, semi lame answer. I'm not sure if I've come up to your high standards there, but, um, thanks for the compliment. So, um, yeah, there were, there are a couple more. I'm sorry I didn't get to, um, but don't worry, we will capture those and they will go on the list. Um, and thank you so much all for your uh, questions, which were awesome. And a big shout out to Lee and anybody else who pre-typed the questions and then copied and pasted them because that was awesome. Um, and thanks for everyone for who contributed. Um, so uh, this session is recorded, as you can probably see by just looking where it says recording, and that's going to it's going to appear in our Facebook group. Which, if you don't, if you're not already a member, we'll send you an email saying come look at the Facebook group. We can see all the previous recordings. Um, and uh, I hope you have an awesome week. Thanks so much. Thanks, Raf. Thanks, Raf. Amazing. Thank you. Thanks, Lee. Thank you. Bye. Bye. So this is where we just stick around just a little bit longer because sometimes <laughs> people have got a question. Secret that they're, questions. They're like, oh, it wasn't quite game to ask this in front of everybody, but I do have this question. So if there is a one, now's your chance to ask it. And sometimes people are just sticking around because I think, oh, I wonder if anyone else has got an interesting <laughs> question. I have one, Raph, actually. We have time. Okay. What is it? Um, last session we talked about um, you can't long term, you can't stretch a muscle in the long term. Uh, and it will always come back to where it was, if, I, if that's what I understood. But I couldn't touch my toes when I started Pilates, and now I can. Mm -hmm. So I did stretch, I feel. Am I wrong? Is, did I understand wrong? Or No, you've basically got it. So what uh, moving from not touching your toes to touching your toes is an increase yeah. in flexibility, an increase in range of motion, okay, uh. which – may or may not correspond to the actual muscles getting longer, right? So there are other possible explanations for how you became more flexible. Okay. That, that are not, that don't involve the muscles themselves physically getting longer. Okay. Um, and so just to nuance that a little bit, um, it is possible to elongate muscles, but it's, uh, only a little bit and it's really, really, you have to do extreme stretching, like extreme stretching, you know, like they get rabbits, put their leg in a cast in an extended position, leave it there for two weeks, right? You know, that type of extreme <laughs> to mm. elongate and then they kill the rabbit, take the leg out of the cast, take the muscle out, measure it, take the muscle out of the other leg, measure that, they find, oh, the one in the cast is longer, right? So they... It is possible to elongate muscles, but like that's an extreme situation. And then what they find is if they do that and then they take the rabbit out of the cast and let it just hop around normally and then kill it a month later after that and measure it, the muscle goes back to how it was. 
right? So, so there will, for the next session, maybe my question will be what's the difference between flexibility and strength, stretching, like stretching a muscle. There's a difference between lengthening the muscle and becoming more flexible. Well, the, the short answer is um, it seems like the most likely explanation for how you get more flexible is you just like when you can't touch your toes, right? You try and touch your toes, you can't. Well, what stops you is pain, right? It hurts. Mm. Right? I mean, you could no. touch your toes. You know, I mean, if if an elephant sat on your back, you know, you could touch your toes, right? But you would be screaming, right? Mm. And that's why you don't do it just by yourself. So uh, the, the current sort of best explanation, which is not like proven fact, but it's like no one can think of a better explanation that hasn't been ruled out, is that basically when you stretch, you become – desensitized to those painful stretch sensations and you you just tolerate that and that position is no longer painful for you so you can go a bit further before the the pain becomes intolerable see that's great thanks (laughs) yeah all right good secret question (laughs) and keep stretching because stretching will improve your flexibility but it just probably won't make any difference to the actual physical length of your muscles okay yeah have a great week see ya um, I always use that word lengthening in my class. People seem to like it, but it, I'm not meaning lengthening of the body, lengthening of like lengthening of the muscles. It's just think long, think straight, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, our job is not to force everyone to understand anatomy and biomechanics, right? Our job is to give them a great class and help them get more flexible and stronger, right? And so if they walk out thinking they've lengthened their muscles, who cares? You know, it's like it's not the end Let of the world. Let them believe whatever yeah. they want. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Don't don't show them what's behind the curtain necessarily, unless they ask, right? If they if if your client come up to you and ask and said, "Oh, am I really stretching my muscles?" Well, then you could have a chat with them about it. But it's like most of them couldn't care less, you know. Yeah. <laughs> they just they just want to be able to touch their toes. That's all. So true. Or just bend the knees while you touch your toes, and then stop bending the knees as you keep coming up. That's what I always say to people: just work within your range. Just build yourself up. Never get them, you know, push them to go there straight away. Mm. My my flexibility is in proved dramatically and dramatically since I've, um, yeah, just been moving every day, yeah. moving the heels, right, at the end of the day. I love it when people come to my class, right, and they go, oh, what injuries or pains? And they go, lower back pain. I go, hmm, 90% of the population. <laughs> I feel like I'm you when I say that. <laughs> it's, <so laughs> it's like, yep, that's what led me to Pilates and probably 70% of the people that do Pilates have back pain. Yeah. Well, probably 70% of the people who don't do Pilates also have back pain. So, <laughs> yeah, but managing it and making yourself feel better, like you said, just before you get out of bed in the morning, it doesn't feel so great. But as soon as you start moving, like for me yeah. personally right now, I love it. No, feeling really high, feeling really happy. Thank you. I'm glad to hear it, Christina. And thanks for your contribution. Thank you. See you, everyone. Have an awesome week. <laughs>